Hi everyone, as it's reached midday, we're going to get started. First of all, thank you so much for coming. When there's so many events on, it's really encouraging to see a full room. Um, it's my first time at this conference, so I feel very privileged to get the chance to present a panel to you, but actually this is more of a discussion, really. This is what we want to do. So just to introduce a little bit, my name's Laura, Laura Oliver. I'm based in the UK. I've been a journalist for 15 years, and for the past five years, I've been working um, as a freelancer. And I'm one of thousands of freelancers across Europe, across the world, uh, often a little bit overlooked as a sector in our industry, despite its size, and a bit under-supported. But actually, I really firmly believe that freelance journalists being such a diverse range of stories and skills into media, into newsrooms. So today's session, we're going to discuss some of the challenges of freelancing and working this way, some of the opportunities, some things we think the industry could help us do a bit better. Um, and I've got a wonderful panel that I'm going to introduce you to in a minute. As well as being a freelance journalist, um, I, along with Abigail, to my left, um, and two other wonderful freelancers, two years ago founded a society, the Society of Freelance Journalists. And this was based around, I'm not going to lie, a bit of a panic um, as different COVID restrictions started to come in, started to affect the work opportunities we had. And in March 2020, we had a phone call, uh, a Zoom call, of course, uh, four of us to discuss what we might do and, and to have a panic and to have a bit of a, a moan and a worry about how it was going to affect our work. And that phone call still happens every Thursday and has happened every Thursday for the last two years and has now expanded to a community of more than 2,000 people who join us on Slack, who drop in to chat. So usually we have our, our virtual coffee break on a Thursday, but today we're going to have it here with you. So this is very much meant to be a discussion a chance for you to ask questions. Please, if we don't have time to answer every question, come and speak to us outside. To be honest, come and have a glass of wine with us or a coffee with us, that would be really nice. Um, so I'm just gonna introduce my panel before we get started. So as I mentioned, to my left is Abigail Ed, uh, a fellow freelance journalist based in the UK. To my right, I have Ana Maria Salinas, um, an ambassador for the Freelance Journalism Assembly a freelance journalist and a communication specialist. And just at the end, I have Priyanka Shankar, a freelance journalist based in Belgium. Um, just to kick us off, first of all, this is very cheesy, I'm sorry. Give me a little wave if you are a freelance journalist or have been a freelance journalist. Ah, excellent waving. <laughs> Give me a wave if you work with freelance journalists or commission freelancers. <laughs> And then give me a wave if you're just here because you like the sound of the panel. <laughs> Yay, okay, great, one, perfect. This is good, this, we, it's important for us to know our audience. So at the beginning of our virtual coffee breaks, we usually just say to each other, how has your week been? You know, how's your working week been? So I'm gonna extend that question a little bit today. And just briefly, maybe with a thumb up uh, or a thumbs down, how has the last two years of freelancing or working with freelancers been for you? Some thumbs. I'm gonna, for me, it's very, this. <laughs> um, um, to my panel, same question. How has the last two years been to you? Oh, oh, this, yeah, we could have had an up and down also. Very positive, right? Yeah. Okay, so just to kick us off, I've got a very short video. Um, as I mentioned, uh, freelancers represent a huge um, number of people in our industry, in the media. Um, we couldn't bring everyone into this room, so we wanted to bring a few more faces from outside. So if my colleagues at the back don't mind pressing play, that would be great. I'm a freelance journalist based in Paris. Hello, I'm Annie Philip, an independent journalist based in India. Hi, I'm George Buin. I am a freelance photo journalist based in Manila, Philippines. Hi, I'm Nathan Koka. I'm a freelance journalist based in Japan. Hi, I'm Laiz Machings. I'm a freelance journalist based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I 
What I love most about freelancing is the opportunity to work on different types of stories for different types of outlets. What I like the most about freelancing is the flexibility and being able to pursue stories I'm really passionate about. What I love about freelancing is you have the freedom to work with anyone you want with and with any project you like. The thing I love most about freelancing is the flexibility it offers, especially when it comes to story subjects. The reason that I like to freelance is because it gives me the freedom to work for many employers while at the same time not having a single employer. So I can spend most of my days not shaving and wearing shorts and I can choose my own hours. The most challenging aspect of freelancing is to find constant work to keep going. What I dislike the most about freelancing is all the bureaucracy and sometimes not having uh, someone else to brainstorm with. The biggest challenge I would say is the fact that rates have barely increased over the last few years and that's especially the case when you take into account the increased cost of living. The Society of Freelance Journalists um, gives freelancers like me who often work alone and work remotely far away a chance to connect and communicate with other journalists who are dealing with some of the similar challenges. The Society of Freelance Journalists has helped provide a community from members with across the world a sounding board and a sense of solidarity. It's always good to know that you're not alone in this and that you have people you can speak to who are often in the same boat and have the same experiences and who you can turn to for good advice. For me, the best thing about the Society of Freelance Journalists is the solidarity, the support and the wonderful sense of community. These are people I can exchange ideas with and it's just very helpful knowing I'm not alone in my struggles. And before I introduce um, Anna to give us a sneak peek some research. I should say a huge thank you to Anna and her team at the Freelance Journalism Assembly for all the support they've given our community over the last two years. Anna, would you like to introduce the work you've been up to recently? Yes, I would love to do this. And uh, unfortunately or fortunately, the qualitative research support the statements that the freelancers that participated in uh, the video shared with us. In the frame of the Freelance Journalism Assembly, a program run by the European Journalism Center with the support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we launched a survey to map the current state of freelance journalism in Europe. We did this because we knew there were some studies at the local or national level, but there was not enough information at the European level. And this data is key to uh, promote more awareness about the challenges, the needs of the community, and also promote conversations around alternatives that can benefit the freelance ecosystem. To do so, we included four main elements. Of course, we need to understand uh, the demographic profile or profiles of our uh, members of the community, also identify the working conditions, priorities, needs, and pinpoint alternatives to empower the community of course. And before I start sharing some of these figures, I would like to mention that this is a sneak peek at the preliminary results of the survey. That means that you are the first ones in seeing these results. In June this year, the European Journalism Center is going to publish a complete analysis. So 925 freelance journalists based in 42 countries respond to the survey. And we found something interesting, as you can see, I, I hope it's visible, but uh, in the first graph, you can see the distribution by age group. According to our respondents, we found that 46% are in the age group between 31 and, and 45 years. This is connected with the fact that we found a community that is uh, experienced and highly educated. In the second graph, you can see that 57% of the freelancers who participated in the survey have more than five years of experience working as freelancers. Regarding the level of education, we found that 52% have masters or professional degrees, and 63 had a specific education in journalism. So we have this experienced and highly educated community that is also driven by its commitment to truth. When we ask freelance journalists, why did you decide to go freelance? 
they say it, around the 60%, they, they, they decide to go freelance because of the freedom and the flexibility uh, of uh, choosing topics, uh, stories, uh, sources, formats, and only 22% say that they went freelance because they were not able to find positions in uh, news organizations. So I think this debunks this mistaken idea that freelancers go freelance because they don't have other options. Actually, they are aware that this independency make the community um, a relevant actor in democracies, in a public debate, in societies. They are evidently committed to truth. Um, they are also interested in uh, reporting, educating audiences and holding those in power uh, to account. So we have this resilient community, but we found out that 57% of respondents feel, think that uh, the working conditions of freelancers have worsened it over the last five years. And this is connected with the fact that the COVID uh, uh, pandemic uh, brought with it uh, this sudden loss of income, more uh, obstacles to travel and report, and affected the balance between the work and the private life. When we ask about the specific challenges, as expected, one of the main challenges or the biggest challenge is money. And it's understandable because if you see our graph there, around 40% of respondents say that last year, 2021, they earned less than 15,000 euros. This is very concerning if we know that uh, a journalist in average in uh, Europe uh, that is employed will earn three times more or four times more in some cases. Specifically, they say 82% uh, they are concerned with these low rates as expected, 74% say they are uh, worried because they feel they are not able to save for the future. And finally, 72% said they uh, are worried about this variance in the income they receive every month. And money is the biggest of the issues, but it's not the only one. Here you can see the five uh, highlights we wanted to share with you. As expected, 57% say that one of uh, uh, the concerns is uh, getting pitches accepted. And I, I think it's because uh, still getting commissions is uh, um, part of the biggest income they receive. On the other hand, we found out that 54% are concerned with mental health and 51% are concerned with this balance between the private and the personal life. And finally, I would like to close mentioning that we identified that more and more freelancers are um, get, uh, feeling overwhelmed with the administrative uh, task. And now we are talking about invoices, visas, uh, understanding, uh, understanding different tax and legal systems, and of course, uh, uh, the fact that they need to defend the uh, author's rights. So we have this uh, experienced community, highly educated, committed uh, to true, that is facing different challenges. And now the question is, can we find alternatives to improve the situation of the uh, freelance ecosystem? How can we make it? No, Laura, <laughs> how can we make it? <laughs> Thank you so much, Anna. And it is really interesting that the results coming in from your initial analysis, mm -hmm. the video that was made completely separately shows such similarities. The questions we are getting in now, picking up on the same themes. So I want to weave in some of the questions that you're submitting, but let's start with perhaps the the more challenging aspects of freelancing and we'll work our way towards a more positive positive ending. Okay. Um, Abigail uh, Priyanka, for you, what are the biggest challenges right now as a freelance journalist? Um, so I've been freelancing on and off since about 2015 and in between that I've done staff jobs but I just prefer the flexibility of freelancing. And I guess the biggest challenge for me is one that probably every freelancer here has experienced in um, inconsistent payments. So you file a piece of work and some companies have payment dates that are that pay you in 30 days, sometimes it's 45 days. Um, I've had companies that have not paid me for three months and I've had to start charging late fees, um, which I would highly recommend that you all do. It's funny how people suddenly pay you when you start charging late fees on top of the fee that you should be getting. Um, so yeah, just, just trying to manage that. I mean, when you're freelance, you don't have um, a payroll department to do that for you. So uh, the time that it takes you to chase up those payments is time taken away from other work that you could be doing. Well, definitely 
come back to this issue of pay as well, Priyanka, and it's fine if that's also been the most challenging thing for you recently, but yeah, tell us yeah, your take. No, I think for me, bureaucracy is a big, big, big challenge because um, I'm originally from India. I've been freelancing in Belgium now for two years, and a big part of everything I own goes into bu bureaucratic fees, into admin, into taxes, um, constant consular fees, and that that just when I feel like, oh my God, I've got it, I've, I feel like I'm sustainable now, like I get a big letter from the Belgian government of like, yeah, you need to pay for this, you need to pay for that. And I, that, that's definitely um, a big challenge for me, but also I feel that there are a lot of hidden costs in freelancing. Uh, you might be doing a story, let's say a six minute radio piece, and it, it, you know, it, it has a fixed rate, but to do that, there are a lot of travel costs that editors often don't agree to pay. Uh, it's something that you have to take on by yourself, and um, sometimes if I'm on assignment and ground, I find myself taking on a lot of extra work to fund that assignment on ground, so that just makes, um, balancing the, the personal work-life balance a bit of a challenge sometimes. Um, so yeah, it, it, it is around pay rate and bureaucracy for me personally, I'd say. Yeah, I, I would like to add also that through the journalism assembly, we identified several challenges that mm -hmm. my, my colleagues here already uh, mentioned it, but um, I would like to add also that uh, the difference between freelancers and staff is that freelancers don't have access to uh, HR or uh, legal departments or uh, uh, social media uh, teams that support them. So more, but I think often or uh, almost always freelancers are dealing with all these challenges by themselves. And yeah, I don't want to get uh, ahead of myself. But I think there is a spoiler. I think these issues are structural issues. And as such, they require a structural answers that involve not only news uh, uh, organizations, but also funders, NGOs, and other actors that are part of the industry. I completely agree. And actually, what I want this discussion to be today is there's two ways of looking at this question, right? There's how I, as an individual freelancer, can sustain my work, sustain my business. Then there's also how can our partners, whether they be media, employers, other parts of the industry, how can they help sustain this part of the sector? So as we've got lots of questions coming in just on this topic, just to weave these in slightly, any very practical tips on the individual side as a freelancer for finding out different rates, for negotiating? How do you approach kind of setting your rate for different types of work? Um, so, you know, as Laura will know, I'm not afraid of talking about money and negotiating rates. Um, I think the more you do it, the less scary it becomes. And as freelancers, we have to get used to advocating for ourselves. Um, in terms of finding out what others have been paid for similar work, it can be quite difficult. Um, in the UK, there's a website called Journo Resources, which is a fantastic website. They have a list of um, rates on there that have been shared by their community. The National Union of Journalists has a similar thing. Um, and also within our community, occasionally, if somebody gets a commission, they will ask the other members, you know, is, it, is, is this a fair rate or have you received more or less for similar work? So really the best way to set your rates is to develop your community so you can get a good sense of whether you're being paid fairly or not. Generally speaking, um, yeah, I'm not afraid to give away my secrets. If I am given a rate for a piece of work, I tend to try and bump that up by at least 25% because I know that there's always extra room in the budget, especially at the end of the tax year. The worst that somebody can say is no. I always ask. 95% of the time I get it, and I've never lost a commission just by asking for more money. So I definitely would recommend all of you do that. Um, Priyanka, anything to... So for me, I think um, when I first got into freelancing, I, as you saw in the video, a lot of us were also like really excited about the aspect of getting to expand your creativity, work with so many editors, work on so many creative projects. So that was really exciting for me and I was just so passionate about getting the opportunity to do stories I wanted, work on projects that I 
never really like looked at rates and talking money. So until I reached a, a, like there was a point when suddenly I realized like, oh my God, I'm being underpaid. So I started listening to this podcast. Uh, it's, I can't remember the name uh, out of suddenly right now, but it was basically about um, how we how we deal with our relationship with money. And I had to actually take that moment. And the first line of the podcast was like, "Do you remember the first time you got paid for something you did and you were passionate about? And how did that make you feel?" And I remember I was 15, and my first ever salary was when my dance teacher made me take dance class. And I remember going back to my mom and saying. I don't know why she paid me. I was just so passionate that I got to take class. And then that struck me. I was like, this is you now again. Like, you're just so excited <laughs> that you can do this, that you haven't even thought about, like, negotiating and rate. And that was that, that, that big game-changing moment when I was like, okay, you're really going going to have to educate yourself because this wasn't taught to me at university and school of how do you negotiate rates? What are your legal rights? How do you... Um, how do you form that email to make sure that you have that relationship with that editor? So it was a lot of like listening, learning from others. I also spoke to Laura here for advice um, and just asking and even I, I think like asking the editor, of course, in the beginning, if you're pitching to someone for the first time and they often tell you this is our rate, maybe the first story, take it. But after you keep building that relationship, um, I think you you have to figure out your relationship with money and then how you go about um, talking about it and framing it. I, what works for one person may not necessarily work for you is the lesson that I've learned. Mm -hmm. So you'd, you'd have to do a little bit of internal work. And um, yeah, that's, that's what I'd say with money, really. Um, I want to ask Anna something in a minute, but a couple <laughs> of questions we've had in around this issue, which I think are really important, are if you are perhaps working internationally, maybe you are pitching to an organization outside of where you are based. But also a, a question from someone saying, you know, should freelance journalists be paid the same regardless of the country they work in and its cost of living? And I was having a conversation with a, a freelance photojournalist recently who had worked extensively in, in crisis and, and, and conflict zones and on those stories. And he just reiterated to me the importance of and this is going to sound like a, a kind of self-help, you know, book, but it's not meant to be, of knowing your value and knowing the value of your story. And that can be incredibly hard when you're under pressure to earn, under pressure to file a story. Um, but he was particularly saying for, for freelancers who maybe work in markets where, you know, the, the rate of pay is even worse than, you know, um, in the UK, for example, uh, you have to you have to know your value because you have to negotiate and also know your value in that your story matters and it's important and people should be paying you for that and for its worth. But Anna, I wondered if there was a, an angle of this of kind of working with other freelancers or, or teaming up and how collaboration might help you also mm -hmm. gain access to new opportunities. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Um, I would like to start mentioning that in 2020, uh, more or less when uh, everything started. I remember reading the predictions of Neiman Lal, and one of them was that the future of, of journalism is collaborative. And I do believe that statement is valid till now and more when we are talking about uh, the future of freelance journalism. I don't think freelance journalists have to fight this battle alone. Actually, I think that when they come together, you can come together in a, a collective, in a community like the Society of Freelance Journalists. You can uh, come together uh, also uh, if you want joining um, associations, unions. You can come together exploring options that are offered by uh, platforms like Hostwriter, like uh, ACOS Alliance, like Solutions Journalism. I, there are so many options around that they offer not only free resources, but they offer also a training uh, regarding uh, negotiation, for instance, or uh, a copyright, how to pitch. And I think here uh, we have to talk about the matter of um, ownership. It's a lot of work indeed, and we know that time is, is highly valuable for freelancers, but I do believe that if you uh, collaborate with each other, you join these uh, kind of communities, you talk with each other, do exchange experiences. 
knowledge. You find a mentor or you are the mentee of another colleague. Then you're gonna be in a better position to uh, deal with the challenges we were mentioning. Um, and I, I would like to, say, to mention something else that please. was uh, related to yeah, uh, please, money and collaboration. <laughs> and it's that um, uh, we are identifying this need uh, of talking about entrepreneurship in the, in the frame of freelance journalism. Even if it sounds a little bit scary, uh, because it's not the soul of journalism, when you study journalism, you don't do it because you want to get rich. That's not um, often the case. When I studied journalism, I did it because I wanted to change the world. But the fact is that we need to uh, get enough resources to cover our, our uh, needs. Uh, to continue doing what we do best, which is uh, telling stories and uh, yeah, mm -hmm. changing the world. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I would like to mention also that it's important that uh, in this context of collaboration, of exchange, of learning from each other, then we also include the conversation about um, entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Can I just add one of more thing? So yeah to what you were saying about knowing your strengths, knowing your skills. Mm. It's really good to spend some time getting really clear about what you bring to the table. And mm. that might be that you have expertise in a particular area or exclusive access. Um, you know, the reason that I don't charge an hourly rate is because I don't value my time in terms of money that way. I value my skills in terms of money. So you might be able to turn out a story quite quickly um, it might only take you a couple of hours, but actually it's taken you years of training and practice to actually get to that point. So, you know, don't think about your, your time, your payment in terms of hours. Think about what you're actually bringing to the table and what you can offer that other people can't. On, on that note, I was going to say also diversify on, on skills, like monetize your skills. You can diversify your revenue with just one story. Maybe you've pitched it as a print story, and it's commission, you can also, you've probably recorded those interviews. So if you're someone good with audio, pitch it as a radio story. If you've taken photographs, pitch it as a photo story. And so with that one thing, you've already like earned your revenue on one story from three different formats. So maybe diversify format, that's the, that's the right phrase here. But that that's personally really helped me. It, it also saves time. Um, you can focus on that one story and you know, and yeah, that, that's a good thing to do. We, we actually had a really good question about that. Um, and please, someone nudge me because I've got another thing to come back to. But maybe you have an example as well, Priyanka. You know, what are the ethics of, of kind of, and this person has put it in quotes, so recycling content. But yeah, if you have a story and you want to publish it in different formats, in different publications, how can you do it well to make sure the sum of the fees that you get paid is fair for the amount of work you've been doing? So I, I have done this diversifying of format. Um, Sally haven't been able to negotiate the fees because it was with newsrooms where they had a fixed rate for uh, video, for radio, for print. Uh, so with one, with one publication, it was radio and print. And I wanted to uh, also sell it as video to another because it, it was a nice, it had nice footage. But what I did was, I think, then just change the angle a little bit. They, they are, copyright does become an issue there where publications are like, OK, but this is exclusive for us. So but then that's a conversation you have to have with your editor in advance, being like, I was just transparent from the beginning. I was like, this other publication was also interested, but this is the angle I'm going to go with that. This is the angle I'm going to go with this. I did overthink it a lot. Uh, it's, it's natural, because I was like, oh, I don't want to lose the commission. Um, but that's something, you know, you, you always have a friend to talk to about that, get advice, uh, vent it out, and then think practically uh, and think about it. Um, did, I, did I answer the whole No, answer? I think that uh, makes a lot of sense. In my experience, when I've done it, it's what, you know, it's practical things of maybe when I was preparing the story, the initial story, I didn't think that I was going to then republish an aspect of it. So I would go back to my sources and update them and say, actually, what you said about this is really interesting. Yeah. Could I pitch a separate story based on that? Um, it, perhaps if it's an editor that I work with a lot that I did the original commission for, I might let them know. But if the stories are, you know, diverse enough, it's gonna, it's gonna be and okay. And sometimes if it's in, so with this story, I remember it was, it was first 
pitched a sprint and because they also had like a video and now social media, they need a video for everything. The socials team mm -hmm. came back and said, do you by any chance have uh, any video footage on this? So, you know, that, that always tends to happen if it's a really, so I'd say when you go into that story, already think in pictures, think in sound, think because it's going to benefit you. Maybe not now, maybe uh, if you do a follow-up, it, yeah. it will, but just try to collect um, all of it. And I, I'd say um, just, just don't be scared to embrace technology and new skills as a freelancer, because it really benefits, I'd say. Yeah. Anna, you want to start? Yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, in this context, it's important to rethink the relevance of collaboration, because sometimes, a freelance journalists think, okay, I have this uh, world of uh, news organizations I'm pitching to, but what if I'm collaborated with another freelance uh, across border? We can uh, sell this, the content in different languages. We will be able to identify different sources or different uh, protagonists of the stories. If the other colleague has different skills, multimedia, photography, video, then you can diversify, as you say, the content and the, the format. So collaboration can be key. You can do it at the individual level, but it's even better if you collaborate because you can then sell your story across borders. And this is happening right now. There are people doing this, getting together in collectives, like you press in France, or uh, um, Investigative Europe, they are doing that. So it's an invitation to reconsider the, this opportunity. Mm -hmm. Maybe try and find someone here you can yeah. collaborate with. To be honest, there's so many amazing <laughs> they, they journalists here. Yeah. Um, this was a question I also wanted to ask the panel, but, and someone submitted it too. But, you know, what can the industry do to help support freelancers professionally? You know, so the, the questioner has asked, should editors and newsrooms take responsibility for our financial situation? You know, working harder to increase fees, working harder to improve our financial well-being. What can, the, what can the broader industry, our editors or their editors, do to help support us professionally? Uh, it's a really interesting question. Um, you know, in all honesty, I think this goes beyond editors. I don't think that they are often the ones who set the rates for the yeah, stories. Um, you know, sometimes editors are desperate to commission freelancers, but they have such a small budget that it makes it very, very difficult. So it's really a conversation that needs to be had right at the top of the organization. And I think there needs to be more awareness of, you know, the benefits that working with a really diverse group of freelancers can bring to your organization. Um, you know, and there's a lot of good things that will come from that. I'm sure we'll talk about that in more depth. Um, but yeah, just, just more awareness of what it can bring and then a conversation of, well, why haven't our rates gone up in five, ten years, which, uh, you know, a lot of them haven't. Um, thinking about safety as well, there were two journalists recently reporting for the Daily Beast um, who were shot in Ukraine because they didn't have the correct safety material, they survived, but... You know, obviously, if you're working with freelance correspondents, especially in dangerous situations, there is a responsibility of the newsroom to make sure that they have the kit that they need. They have safety gear, protective gear. They have the tech that they need. And also that they are, you know, looking after themselves mentally as well. You know, there can be a bit of a, an urge when you're freelance to chase the story and go after it and, you know, not go rogue, but you, you, a lot of people like this job because you can work quite independently. And sometimes you do need an editor to kind of rein you in a little bit and say, well, have you thought about the practicalities of this? Is it safe? You know, what would you do if this came up? So, yeah, I definitely, there's, there's a lot more that editors and newsrooms could be doing to advocate for journalists. I was just going to say as well, something that helped me an awful lot at the beginning of... Um, restrictions, COVID restrictions in the UK was the editors or the newsrooms that extended their their kind of check-ins to their freelance contributors mm -hmm. as well. And I know it sounds very small, but an editor who I work with regularly just checking in to say, how are you doing? Yeah. Are you okay? This is how we're changing how we work because we're all working remotely. And just not, you know, feeling part, part of that team and valued in the same way as their staff contributors. And I think you're, you're so right, Abigail, about the, you know, updating as an industry how we work with different voices, um, including those that come from a freelance position. Something comes up a lot in, in the chats we have on, on our, in, within our community is there's an increased um, interest in diverse voices, 
voices from marginalised communities. Fantastic. Okay, then, if you're commissioning those writers or those reporters or broadcasters, make sure you're paying them fairly. Make sure you are respecting the work that they do. And, yeah, this isn't a kind of flick on a switch, flick off a switch once that story is done. You've got to put the work in in order to build that relationship. But I will now get off my soapbox and um, ask Priyanka and Anna if they want to add anything on what the industry can do. I mean, I, I think the fact that we're having this conversation now itself is like a start um, of some sorts. I, I, I mean, I, I do think, like Abby said, a lot of it is also in the manager's hands because mm. sometimes yes. editors, they all mean well, they do want, but they, I've often got replies yeah. saying, like, it's not my decision. Uh, what's also interesting is when the editor has also been freelance, mm. and I've often found that working with them is a completely different experience than working with an editor who's just... Who's, you know, who's not got that much experience being freelance themselves because they know the struggle, they know how it's a constant hustle and they do really try to like make sure you get a fair share or they also make it a point to give you feedback because when you're in a staff job, you have that appraisal, you have that sort of like session with your managers and editors where you kind of know how you're doing. But when you're freelance, it's often like just getting that commission is like your big win. But it's it's often personally for me, it's really nice when the editor after editing, it's published, comes back and actually tells me how the story did or what I could improve the next time I'm pitching. And that has happened. And that's just, I often save those emails because it's just nice. It's just nice to know that this editor took time and like really gave me that that sort of like support I needed. Oh, so when you're having a bad day, maybe of rejected pitches or something, you look back and you're like, okay, this is probably what they're looking for. Uh, that's, that's also at times when they know that they can't really change the financial situation, but they can mm. definitely help you in, in motivation of some kind. Because as freelancers, we know that we often need that because we're working alone um, and we need that from like that person who's actually going to be looking into your work. So that's really, that's, the more we get that from editors, the more, the more I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's a personal boost, I'd yeah, say. I, agree. I completely agree. I started working with a new editor recently and just getting an email with, oh, your story's published, really good job, really happy with it, here's a link. Just that token of, oh, here you go, thanks for the work you've done, really does make a difference, makes you feel appreciated. The worst thing an editor can do is just to ghost you. Um, and I know editors are very busy and they have overflowing inboxes, but a lot of freelancers put a lot of time and energy into pitching. And to not even get anything back from that sometimes can be really disheartening. Um, so even if it's just a thanks, but it's not right for us this time, you know, you can create a short box in a shortcut in your email just to respond. A lot of a lot of freelancers are happy to get a rejection rather than absolutely nothing at all. I, I completely agree <laughs> with everything you have said, and I wanted to mention that especially after COVID, the whole industry went through a really tough uh, couple of years. So, of course, when we talk about uh, fees and rates, uh, it's a challenge because even newsrooms, they had to go down and uh, yeah, try to manage the situation the best they, they could. What I noticed is that uh, there are more conversations going on. I have m several meetings with news organizations that are asking questions. They're asking, for example, I want to get trained to know how to protect my, my freelance journalists. And then it's, 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 it's great to see that's happening mm. uh, right now. Something that um, we experienced, we tried to have this experiment. There was uh, this uh, uh, amazing group of 5,000 freelance journalists, and we tried to create a tool to connect uh, uh, editors with these uh, uh, journalists through a form, like a request, so where uh, the editor could select the profile they wanted uh, for a specific story, and then the system will uh, send them back a list of options. And it didn't work, and we were wondering why. And we realized it's because uh, maybe there is a lack of spaces to trust, uh, to, to build trust between uh, editors and freelancers. Or maybe it's also an invitation for uh, uh, editors and publishers to uh, take the, 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 jo the jump of faith, you say that? Yeah, leap of faith. The, the leap of faith, yeah. exactly. And uh, uh, try to engage and get on board uh, more freelance journalists. Uh, different to the ones or the correspondents you always work with. 
Um, and maybe you are going to find new collaborators that we are going to love uh, to work with. So this is the experience yeah. we had, but conversations are happening, and, and that's the, the beginning, I think, of uh, the change. And building that, building that trust is very difficult, particularly when, you know, well, it's great because actually we are now in a place where we can meet one another. Yeah. Um, but whether that's in pitching, I've had editors say to me, you know, the more kind of straightforward information you can give me about yourself and how you're going to approach this story helps me to understand whether I will invest in you and this idea and trust you. But equally, as you said, that idea about collaborating, maybe you're new to freelancing, maybe you're new to journalism, um, finding different networks or teaming up with other journalists because of the skills you have to bring. Um, I was just in a panel um, with a speaker from a platform called um, IGAB, which works to support um, sub-Saharan uh, journalists um, to get their stories uh, published in international media. And uh, Dina, the speaker, was saying, you know, I'm trying to use the fact that I have a reputation and trust because I've been working for a long time to help empower people who are new to this sector or haven't had those opportunities. And I think a lot of that kind of support does go on within freelancing. Um, I did say that we were going to start talking about the sort of not so good and move into the more positive aspects of freelancing. But just before we do, because it's something Priyanka mentioned and it has come up in a question, you know, financial instability is a big kind of issue that we've discussed a lot already. But working alone and loneliness, and as I said, you know, our society started because I was having a bit of a lonely panic, and then I found some wonderful people who were very supportive. We panicked with you. We panicked together. Um, you know, how can we best protect our, our well-being, our mental health in this line of work? What can newsrooms and organisations do as well to help us? Um... Well, so I'm a big people person. So of course, when the pandemic hit and suddenly I was like, oh my God, you're not going to see people. And also like, you're not, you don't have those weekly check-ins and when you're, you're, you're freelancing. So it was important for me to join networks and that's how I found the Society of Freelance Journalists, also the Solutions Journalism Network, which really taught me to look at every challenge as a solution and embrace complexity. So it was nice. It was nice to have those networks where you'd have regular check-ins um, where you could just you know, like talk about your day, whether it was good or bad. And um, through the Solutions Journalism Network, I also learned something called looping, where um, you basically, it's, it's an interview technique of really like asking a series of questions till you get to the underlying motive of why a person thinks the way they do. And I started applying that in my personal life. And that's something I really, I learned it during the pandemic. And now every time I'm having a tough time freelancing with a really fellow freelancer and close friend of mine, um, we often have this session where we loop. We don't call it venting, but we're just like, okay, so how's your day been? And how is it with this publication? And um, are you... We also talk about money because that is a big thing of mental health. So really, like, like we kind of hold each other as our money accountability buddies, but we like really like keep asking each other these questions, like an interview format, but just till we get to the underlying motive and then we feel better. The other thing that, I mean, with mental health, um, I don't know, just do your hobbies, go for a run, dance. A good cry helps. Well, it's, it's, it's a tough industry. It's not, it's not, it's not normalize crying, normalize going for therapy. And I would also say if you're having a tough time, tell an editor. There have been times, especially now in the pandemic, where it's okay to tell the editor, I might need a little extra time to submit this. And um, they have, some of them do understand it. Of course, if it's a deadline, you need to tell them well in advance. Uh, but I would say prioritize your personal needs before um, of the work. Work will always be there, but you need to be well first. So, yeah, for me, it's always running and music and um, looping with my, <laughs> with my friend. Yeah. I love this idea, looping. It's I didn't know this before. Excellent. I'm going to borrow this word. This is excellent. Anna, anything to add? Um, um, maybe yes, uh, that we notice from the Freelance Journalist Assembly that especially after COVID, more initiatives like uh, the Society of Freelance Journalists uh, were uh, coming up and uh, it was nice to see how the, the, the community was coming together. 
because some, at some point we always had like this question like uh, or this uh, idea of uh, uh, competition versus collaboration and then uh, just starting talking to each other it's a great start mm -hmm. and that's why I think we had these experiments with the coffee breaks two years ago or more and it was uh, very uh, impressive what was happening because we were having very honest conversations about feelings, about emotions, about how to support each other and sometimes you just need someone to to ask you how you feel, and that's it. And uh, yeah. sharing can, in some cases, uh, save uh, the person of having a horrible day. Uh, and then, yeah, that's, that's, I think, also, again, an invitation for other organizations to offer this kind of, uh, of support. It doesn't matter what's your uh, topic, if it's uh, safety, if it's uh, solutions journalism. Let's try to include mental health as a transversal topic. And of course, there are other initiatives that uh, uh, came out like a headlines network and uh, like uh, the self-investigation that you can explore. They have free uh, guides and they have uh, training that you can use to improve your uh, mental health. All links will be shared after the session. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just going to say that I noticed a stark difference moving from a staff news job when I became freelance. Not so much because the environment around me was was sort of forcing me to, to not express emotion, but probably my own perception of how I should act in that newsroom to when I became freelance. And I mean, you've seen me in all kinds of states in the last two years, you know, because it's just, you know, you, you find other people going through the same thing and actually there is no point not normalizing it and sort of being very honest about it. Yeah. Abby, anything you do or anything you think the industry can do to help Interesting what you just said about almost having to put that public face on to go into the office. You know, I really hate that phrase, leave your personal problems at home, because you can't necessarily make that distinction. You can't leave everything at the door as soon as you go into work. So, you know, I'm the opposite to Priyanka. I'm quite introverted. I love to be around people, but I also do my best creative work when I'm working by myself in my loft um, with my cat. So for me, <laughs> newsrooms are quite creatively draining. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I enjoy spending time alone. The thing that's really important for me is to schedule breaks. So I make sure that I take an hour for lunch because I'm freelance and I don't have to eat a crappy pre-made sandwich at my desk. I can actually go and make a good lunch, go for a walk, and just trying to soak up the benefits that being freelance brings. You know, I don't start work till 10 o'clock most days mm -hmm. because that for me is the optimum time to start work. And before that, I'll potter around the house, do some yoga, you know, feed my cat, do some chores. And I just think tapping into the benefits of freelancing, the idea that we need to work a nine to five job five days a week is so archaic. And the benefit of working for yourself is that you can find the patterns that suit your schedule. So tapping into that, I think, is a really good way to, to boost your mental health. This is an excellent segue to ask you what the benefits kind of professionally for you have been of working in a freelance way. Um, maybe how you've kind of unlocked or protected some of those benefits as well. Um, and what kind of benefits do you think there are for newsrooms to work with, with freelancers? So feel free to answer about yourself or yeah. what you think. I think for me, I really love the variety that comes from freelancing. So journalism has always been my first love. Um, it's actually quite difficult, I think, to make a living as a journalist. At some point, you start getting pushed up the ladder into management and senior stuff. And once you start doing that, you move away from writing so much, which is, you know, for most of us, the reason that we went into these jobs in the first place. So the thing I love about freelancing is that I have more time to write about the stories that I'm interested in. And I've covered all kinds of stuff from, you know, the Taylor Swift sexual assault trial in Denver, Colorado, to stuff about cryptocurrency, to, you know, alt-right protests in America. And it's really, really varied. It keeps me on my toes. And it's, it's kind of like if something grabs my attention and I want to know more about it, I have the freedom to chase after that and see where it goes. Um, having said that, I teach and I also do corporate copywriting for startups. I don't know if you count many starters as corporate, but I, I do copywriting. So I have a balance of different types of work. Um, again, some of that is financial. Some of that is just because it's, it's practical. It's regular income. But I really like the variety of that. Um, I previously worked at the BBC. And in that role, I was a senior social media producer. And I was 
desperate to actually do some writing. I love social, I love that side of things, but it really killed me to find really great stories on Twitter and then have to pass them off to somebody else to write. So I like the fact that I can do all of that in my freelance career. Um, Priyanka? Mine is, my, I mean, I, I agree with you completely. I mean, I'm also someone who really lives for an adrenaline rush. So every day <laughs> in freelancing, since I got into it, feels like a new adventure because maybe one day is an adventure of like this excitement of just pitching and one day is an ex like learning something new. Um, it's, it could be working on a podcast, getting into a really big investigative story. And I think learning, I think that's been the biggest um, new thing for me while freelancing was unlearning a lot of things that you, um, when you're when you in, a, in a staff job, you have a certain way of doing it, you have a certain way of um, their editorial process, and then freelance, you're working with so many different editors. So I feel like I'm learning like different styles, different, uh, whether it's long form, whether it's podcasting, every publication has their style. So every day feels like I'm unlearning and learning, which is somehow, I, I really like that. I, I think that's definitely a benefit. And of course, also the fact that I can take a break whenever I want to. The fact that I could, I mean, many I had many friends back in Brussels who wanted to come to Perugia but couldn't get time off because their editors and bosses were here. So, but as a freelancer, you can do that. Um, but I think, yeah, for me, it's also the, having the, the aspect of really working on projects that I'm really passionate about. And mm. the fact that it's an adventure, it, it definitely is. And if you like it, then this is something you've. This is something meant for you, I guess. Adventure is good. Sometimes a roller coaster, but yeah. definitely an adventure. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I said adrenaline rush. It's like <laughs> I will take that risk if I'm really like into it. And Anna, what about from the sort of newsroom or titles perspective in terms of working with freelancers? What opportunities do you have you seen through your work? Mm, I would like to go back to what you were mentioning mm. about diversity, equity, and inclusion, because uh, as we know. Um, this is one of the main topics right now in the news industry because of the, sorry. <laughs> we need to hear. Yeah, it's important. Um, not only because uh, it, it's a conversation that is happening and because it's the correct thing to do, but it, because it's going to end up having a positive impact in the way how news organizations engage with audiences, in the way how news organizations build trust and uh, ultimately it's gonna have an impact in the revenue of the news organization. So I do believe that one strategy uh, we have as an industry to improve diversity and representation is uh, uh, getting more freelancers on board. Instead of uh, um, writing the story from a desk far from the place where the story is taking place, why not commission that job? Uh, for sure you are gonna bring more uh, fresh ideas, you are gonna bring a, a more accurate uh, comprehension of the context of the story, or you're gonna bring even more balanced sources that are gonna have a positive impact in uh, representation, diversity, and of course, uh, ultimately, it's gonna be positive for the news organization. So we've had two questions in. As we've got eight minutes left, I want to sort of use these to, to see us out. Um, please forgive my pronunciation if I mangle your name. Um, Hakan Stolberg, who I believe is from the Danish Union of Journalists, asks, how could your local journalism union help better the realities of freelancing? So going beyond kind of a, a union's role might be to help collect late fees or to, to lobby on your behalf legally. What else could local or journalism unions help do? What would you like to see? For me, it concerns that issue of pay and advocating for faster payments, um, more transparency around payments. You know, it shouldn't be right that one freelancer gets paid three times more for a story just because they've asked for it, basically, um, than somebody else. Um, and also, I think building that sense of community. Yeah. So, you know, the weekly check-ins that we have are so simple. I mean, it's literally just a bunch of people logging onto Zoom, often with a tea or coffee, you know, everybody is very casual, working from home, and it's just a chance to check in with each other. And I think building those communities, particularly locally, um, is really important because as well it can help to ease the isolation that some freelancers can feel. I 
So in India, to get into a local journalist union is a challenge because press freedom is a challenge. So not many of us even have a union. And um, in Belgium, the fees are really high. So I think if you really want to help freelancers, let get, for, for journalist unions, I think it should just be important that they let freelancers join in for free because especially when we have like tough legal situations, we really need the union support. We need that sort of backing. Uh, which I haven't really had many times. So it's been like me personally, like trying to learn my legal rights, trying to find an immigration lawyer, and that's a lot of stress. And I've personally been really disappointed with unions not being there to support me when I need it, especially international journalists, especially if you are a foreign freelancer working in a country that's not your home country and paperwork is not in your language. This is where like, the unions need to really come in and help. And I do feel the unions do a really good job in the US uh, where they're really supportive. And um, I'm still waiting to see that more in Asia and Europe. So, yeah. yeah, there's probably an opportunity for the kind of, sort of service journalism we talk about in terms of resources or, or you know, community building events, actually, that would be so great. Um, the final kind of question that I wanted to add from Anonymous is, how can editors give freelancers more say in the decision-making process to have their voices at the table without adding unpaid work on their shoulders? And I'm going to add here, maybe not just editors, maybe their editors or, or, or their managers or the operation at large. So how can we get freelance voices into the commissioning process earlier? How can we get them into discussions about how we work earlier on? I think a good editor will, will have those conversations with you. And I know not all editors have time for this, but you know, there's one publication that I work for... Um, narratively so narratively their their pitching process has been excellent so far they're very conversational in you know exactly what they want from the story they have very clear writers guidelines which makes it much easier when you're pitching because you know the kind of stories that they're looking for um, they also have a weekly call out for pitches on their website so you know rather than just pitching into the void you actually have a better idea of the kind of stories that they want um, and then you know which your pitch is accepted they want an outline from you and you kind of discuss the angles of the story and the main scenes. Now, I guess you maybe have to have more conversation for narratively pitches because it's long form, it's narrative. So there has to be that kind of story arc. But I think there's, there's potential to do that for any story. I think, you know, when there's a breakdown in communication and maybe the freelancer submits something that isn't quite what the editor was expecting, that's wasted work on both sides. So I think people are scared to pick up the phone as well. I mean, the best editors will always leave a number and say, you know, give me a call if you've got any questions. Um, and I often do that because I think it's really important for building relationships. And it's also easier to be clear about communicating over the phone rather than on email when sometimes things can get misinterpreted. Um, so once you start, I had this experience with one publication that I write for where after I regularly started publishing for them, the editor started involving me in the planning meetings where it was every Wednesday and they were like, okay, she's also been pitching on this topic. So, you know, and it's sort of like we discussed the pitch with everyone else in the newsroom, which was really nice. It kind of made me feel a little like, okay, I know what they're looking for, what they're uh, what the rest of the people think about it, also the, the target audience, that because you know they, they keep having so many internal meetings inside, and as a freelancer, you're not always aware of that. So if once you build a relationship with an editor, you regularly freelance with one publication, feel free to ask. Uh, getting involved in the planning meeting happened with me saying, okay, uh, you've been rejecting a couple of pitches. Is there something I can improve? And that's when the editor was like, you know what, why don't you join the meeting? And then you'll know what we're looking for. And that was really nice. Um, also, as Abby said, so they, sometimes they do tweet out what exactly they're looking for. Uh, maybe you can ask. They, they also send out a mailing list in some newsrooms to their correspondents. And if you are a regular freelancer, you can ask for that. Uh, a lot of it just came with just asking, uh, what's the worst that could happen? They'll say no. <laughs> and then you'll feel bad about it. But just ask. Um, and then you never know. And yeah. they, they want to help. They want to get those voices. And 
show initiative. I've, I've learned a lot by just showing initiative and being mm -hmm. enthusiastic. On that note, as we only have two minutes left, um, if you don't ask, you don't get. So if, I, if we didn't pick up on your question, we're all still here, we'd love to talk to you, or look at the Freelance Journalism, Journalism Assembly resources, join the Freelance Society Slack group, we can talk about all these things. I would like to take just one moment to acknowledge the freelancers who can't be at this festival, who are working and reporting under increasingly difficult conditions, those who are covering conflict and crisis right now, many of whom are taking huge personal risks um, and assuming great responsibility to do so. I'd also like to say a huge thank you to Anna and Priyanka and Abigail for joining me today and for everyone who came. Um, so yes, thanks so much for coming. Yeah. 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 Yeah.